Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from uh, wherever you're joining. Uh, welcome to today's uh, Terabytes session, online event of uh, the ISTVS, the International Society of Terrain Vehicle Systems. Uh, I'm Lutz Richter, co-hosting the uh, event today with Massimo Martelli. Uh, we're both ISTVS officers, uh, let's say. Uh, Massimo is the general secretary of our organization, and I'm the, the so-called first vice president. And both of us have been active in, in ISTVS for a number of years. And uh, some of you joining today uh, may have attended previous editions of our DES series, the digital event series, uh, over the past two years or so. And uh, after a little break, we're now today uh, having another one of these events. Um, important introductory messages, I would say, or useful introductory messages at this stage. Uh, if you in the audience would like to speak up or or notify or, or post a message, please use the chat function. Uh, we can open the microphone to attendees. Uh, yes, we're able to do that uh, during the Q&A portion, for instance. Uh, but generally, the easiest, the safest way is to use the chat function. And uh, I don't know if, if those of you on the line would like to just uh, drop in the chat from where you are joining. That would be useful to know. And um, so we will have, today we will have two presentations uh, covering our single hour of, of the event that we're having. And uh, this is related to uh, the ISTVS uh, conference that we had two years ago. It was an online meeting still because of the pandemic hosted by the Harbin um, Institute of Technology in China. Uh, that was one of our uh, ISTVS annual conferences. It was, uh, let's say, an Asia Pacific conference, technically speaking. And following that meeting, uh, we selected uh, a number of papers that would be published uh, in the Journal of Terra Mechanics that ISTVS uh, is editing, that which is our peer-reviewed journal, Journal of Terra Mechanics. So we, uh, by now, we've published around ten of these so-called best conference papers in the journal, um, and there are a few more coming before we wrap up the special issue. And today's DES event is revolving around two. Uh, of those papers. So we will have speakers, presenters that uh, will present uh, their papers that uh, have been accepted uh, for the journal and that are in press or have already been published. And uh, there is a Q&A portion. Uh, so after each of the two talks, uh, we will have the chance to address questions by the audience, questions by you. And during the talk, please uh, type any questions you may have in the chat, and then we can pull those up uh, for discussion in the Q&A portion. Um, did I forget anything in the introductory remarks, Massimo? I don't think I forgot anything. I, I think you covered you covered everything, so. We should be ready to start with the actual presentations. Good. And okay, first up is Daniela uh, Spaczynska from Poland. Uh, she is uh, with the Military University uh, of Poland, based in Warsaw, the capital of Poland, and she's a PhD student. And uh, again, she authored one of the papers in the special issue following the Harbin host conference. And she will be talking about uh, UGVs, uh, the mobility system of UGVs, and considering different uh, configurations and architectures of tracked mobility systems uh, of UGVs. 
uh, with a particular focus on, on defense applications. Daniela, if you are ready, uh, you may switch to screen share to share your presentation. Uh, yes, I'm ready. Um, hello, everyone. Um, good uh, morning and good afternoon. Um, just to try to share my screen. Let us know if you need any help. Um, yeah, it may take a few seconds to, uh, to bring up the screen. Yeah, it's loading. Here we go. Um, go okay. Uh, so uh, my name is Daniela Szpaczyńska. I'm a PhD student from Military University of Technology uh, in Warsaw, Poland. And it's a great pleasure to um, and honor for me to attend this event and to present the result of our simulation comparative study of the lightweight UGV track running gears mobility. Uh, my presentation uh, is related to the paper I co-authored and it was about running gear construction impact on overcoming obstacles by light height mobility tracked UGVs. Um, about unmanned ground vehicles, they are widely used in many areas but especially elderly in the military. They support troops in diverse tasks, uh, as you can see, but generally their basic, basic functions are uh, to transport and operate with specialized equipment in the environment that is mostly dangerous to humans. Because of that, to be functional, they must provide a specific capabilities. The main ones are appropriate mobility level, understood as efficiently and independently overcoming rough terrain with all of its terrain obstacles and also teleoperation mobility and working with sufficient operating speed for enough time specified by military requirements. Um, military reports highlight that this is difficult to achieve these abilities and especially for lightweight UGVs that weighing up to 300 kilograms. It is due to the scale effect, uh, the dimension of the terrain roughness become relatively larger for light UGVs and also as you can see poorer ground contact decreases not only their stabilities but also uh, ability to achieve traction force which is crucial for overcoming terrain that way the typical terrain roughness might become a series of obstacle terrain for light uh, UGVs another limitation to be considered is a running gear shape and construction which differ in currently used UGV of different uh, weight class. Um, so there are systems with rigid structure um, and they usually achieve a lower drive speed and the systems um, are not well adapted to the overcome rough terrain while in some UGVs we have more complex structures and elements uh, moving and flexible elements such as um, boogies or rockers and that allowed them to drive faster through rough terrain. So the aim of the study was to compare different track systems and uh, evaluate their impact, the impact of their structure on light platform mobility. And this assumed carrying out simulation tests as a simulation object, we consider a single track system of a light two, uh, 200 kilograms UGV. A track dimensions uh, provided normal pressure of level, of, of level um, 10 kilopascals. And its running gear elements was connected in four different structures selected from currently used solutions. Uh, 
to and we selected all rigid solution also solution with two boogies solution c was solution with two boogies which was elastically mounted to the frame and solution d a type of fracker boogie construction mm. and to consider the impact of the track tension to mobility two variants of track tensions were analyzed variant first uh, was loose track that assumed the lowest tension that allows to sleep uh, free driving um, and uh, variant second which was tensed one and generate twice smaller deflection uh, than in the first variant to evaluate the chosen solution we um, selected five terrain obstacles that uh, were representative uh, for light UGVs operation environment and we selected uh, a carp typical for urban terrain a laying log um, also wavy um, roughness of the terrain profile which can reflect uh, vegetation clumps every one meter also um, a small form of roadside or drainage ditch and a slope Solutions were assessed on the basis of nine diverse criteria that concern general effectiveness parameters, grant and drive system load, and grant pressure distribution. Um, the track running gear, gear model of each solution um, was built in ADAMS program. Uh, multi-body dynamic simulations program and it consisted of sprocket idler and uh, four road wheels and also a rubber belt which uh, was modeled as a series of 56 links connected with each other by general force vectors uh, force characteristics were identified in experimental test of track susceptibility uh, and as a stiffness and damping coefficients um, were implemented to the model the experiment concerned measuring the static uh, deformation and oscillation of the track after being being loaded and uh, simulation ex and experiment oscillation plots were compared by its amplitudes, periods, uh, and damping decrements. Mm, it was noted that the most accurate description of the rubber track behavior was obtained by using nonlinear and non symmetrical stiffness characteristic, um, rotational stiffness characteristic. Uh, for different angle of deviation. Each of track segments also interacted with the ground. There was considered elastic ground uh, model based on Adam's uh, contact function. And the stiffness parameters were set up to obtain a slight few millimeters uh, sinkage on flat surface. Also, it was assumed 15% of rolling resistance um, coefficient uh, that was obtained in previous studies of similar, similar class of uh, uh, platforms. Uh, also, the normal uh, load of each link and its displacement while uh, contact with the ground was used to calculate uh, traction force uh, in accordance with shear stress, shear displacement relationship. Mm, which soil properties parameters were obtained by validating the model with experimental results. It was three types of soil, option one, two and three. Um, and we used uh, data that were available in literature. Uh, you can see one of validating simulation when the track systems 
were loaded, increasingly breaking force to achieve its higher slip. Um, this type of model allowed to obtaining different traction forces, uh, different traction forces value depending on the contact with the ground surface and different pressure distribution. So uh, it was necessary in rough terrain simulation when frequent loss of segments ground contact uh, might occur. You can observe uh, also in a pink segment uh, the traction force that is generated only when the segment contacts the ground and this force value increase when uh, it's loaded uh, by uh, this road wheel. Moving on to the simulation results. Uh, while slope negotiating, the necessary driving force was determined by uphill resistance. So it was similar for all solution. But a significant moment was uh, the slope's exit when the track contact with the ground um, drastically decreased. Uh, it occurred uh, high slip values, especially for solution A, all rigid solution. And that turned out to be critical in this case. So. Um, Rocker buggy solution, it's here, was able to allow to, uh, to climb uh, 40 degrees slope. And we can also notice differences in slip values of rigid solution for three different grounds. The slip plots have similar characteristics, but the time of obstacle negotiation uh, differ. So, we can see that the most disadvantageous conditions in this case were, was clay soil, uh, option two, and um, the greatest opportunities to achieve differences between solutions provide uh, compact soil, um, option uh, three. So the next result I will present will be mostly on uh, this type of soil. Mm, most difficult obstacle to overcome turned out to be the carp. Um, due to its relatively uh, high required tractive force, mm, which have to be generated from a few track segments in contact with the ground, uh, it was uh, mm, this this obstacle was unreachable for solutions without elastic elements so solution a and b wasn't able to overcome this obstacle uh, another single obstacle was a lock and still because of poor track uh, ground contact uh, its overcoming was characterized by high and long lasting slips mostly for solution a and b and as you can see, uh, this contributed slower overcoming this obstacle, which resulted in higher, um, above 40% higher energy consumption in these solutions. Increasing the track tension also increased energy consumption due to the internal losses that affect on needing driving force. When comparing the solution C performance on variants loose and tensed, we, it can be uh, noted that already on a flat surface before obstacle, the driving force of tensed track was about 40% higher than for loose variant and also maximum values uh, was, was higher for tensed uh, solutions. Also greater track tension each time limits the contact surface uh, between the track and the ground. 
the small ditch negotiations required high pitch values, especially on the entrance here and on the exit phase of obstacle. And its sudden changes not only affect the stability, but also make the teleoperation impossible. So that way use solution C, which limit pitching angle from 30 to 18 degrees would be very advantageous. Mm. Overcoming this obstacle also was characterized by high momentary uh, track segment loads. And their, more, their most uniform distribution was ensured by solution D, uh, which reduced uh, the maximum loads from uh, of one segment uh, uh, about 50 percent overcoming clumps of vegetations it can be noticed that even in case of slight roughness of the terrain the track contact with the ground is reduced even up to three times for solution a and b while solution C used entire available length of the track, uh, of the track with contact with the ground. And thanks to it, it the solution did not sliding down the roughness, causing more uniform course of driving force. And even its maximum values are slower than for other solutions. Uh, this solution also ensured the most even distribution of average Excel loads. It means that it's the smallest difference between uh, driving wheel and idler and or road wheel axles. So comparing all the criteria, it can be seen that solution C is the most advantageous in most categories in all of obstacles. Um, it is due uh, to two spring damping elements that allow to adapt its shape to the ground and improving a number of abilities. Also due to possibility of idler and first boggy deviation, solution D works very well, uh, especially on the single um, obstacles such as lock or ditch and it is advantageous um, improving distribution of pressure between track segment and the ground and also because of it uh, it was able to overcome the highest uh, obstacle the highest slope uh, on the other side uh, solution b was the best in terms of energy consumption. Mm, this is thanks to the lack of spring damping elements, because it turns out that although elastic elements improve track terrain contact, they also tensing the, the track, increasingly um, increasing internal resistant forces. So since um, end of this study, uh, work on the model has progressed further. We analyzed another structures of running gears, and this time it was uh, multi-track ones, and we analyzed them in terms of the connection between uh, two track sections. It turned out that such structures overcome carbs much better than dual track. Uh, and as an obstacle was selected also regular size ditch and a log. Um, also in this case, um, we found uh, more and less advantageous solutions, but uh, our assessed criteria slightly changed. And instead of determining the soil parameters, we change them in successive simulations. So that way we determined and compare a minimum grant properties which allowed 
to overcoming obstacle for every solution. We are currently at the stage of developing the model to more precisely calculate rolling resistance, considering um, soil deformation resistance. So um, the elastic grant model was replaced by a model based on the Becker theory. And for each segment, uh, for segment, uh, for sinkage of each segment, is calculated and applied a proper resistance force. Mm, so you can see um, comparing simulation uh, of our previous model and a new one, which allowed to a sinkage, greater sinkage. And we also working on taking into account the resistance um, resulting from slip sinkage. And for this year is planned um, experimental test of our tracked platform that is equipped with speed and driving forces sensors. There is also dedicated for this device braking station, which allowed to measuring the platform drawbar pull. So measurement of the internal and external resistance forces as well as the characteristics of the traction in the function of sleep are planned in our local conditions to um, additionally validate the model. And this would be all. I'm, um, I'd be happy to ask uh, some questions. Very good, Daniela. Thanks very much. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, I see no questions have been posted so far in the chat. Uh, Jorge, I see you attending and you were uh, noting that uh, probably due to a line problem, uh, the, the projection was freezing for you. Um, okay, I, I at least did not have any issues. So I was able to see all of the slides at the presentation and the video stream. Just to let you know, uh, Jorge, um, Okay, um, okay, a couple of questions coming up now. I also have at least one. <laughs> so, uh, Josef Koves is from uh, Montreal. He's asking, can you say a little bit more about how you model the soft terrain? Which coincides with the question I, I uh, would have wanted to ask, let's say. Um, Daniela, I think you used Adams, right? Mm -hmm. uh, however, with an elastic representation of the terrain is that true in the initial setup of the model is that correct yes yes it was elastic um it was uh, characterized by um by this uh, contact function and we need to uh, determine uh, like three or four parameters mm, so we set up these parameters to um, obtain uh, a slip, uh, a sinkage that was calculated uh, by us from, from Becker theory. So um, one second. And we choose that type of uh, grant model. Oh, here is uh, this uh, function and we need to defined a stiffness, um, a damping here, C, uh, and the E, what was uh, exponent of force. Mm, so yes, we set up to obtain three millimeters uh, sinkage and we choose this uh, type of model um, because uh, it uh, won't allow to sinkage and because of that, uh, it won't change the shape of the obstacles. So it was important for us to, mm, to not um, help, uh, for example, all rigid solution to obs overcome obstacles. So first version was um, elastic model 
and uh, it's um, there is also um, one issue because uh, if we want to um, use the formable terrain we need to uh, consider also um, re resistance of uh, the formation so i think we use the elastic model and add some forces that will um, reflect uh, additional resistance from the formations. Okay, related to that, uh, Alex Keen is asking. Uh, Alex Keen is asking related to that about future plans uh, for field tests. I think you described in one of your final slides the plans for demonstrator right a uh, physical model uh, a hardware system to uh, to do field tests because in your presentation i i at least understood that um, mm, there was no attempt made yet to correlate the simulation results with um, field test results of um, of existing systems or do I, did i get it wrong uh, yes, in our simulation, we based on literature that data, and it it wasn't easy to find some data for light UGVs. So um, I think it would be very advantageous to to use our own uh, because uh, our uh, vehicle vehicle uh, is uh, it used the same rubber track that we tested before. And uh, it has um, 400 kilograms, so the mass uh, or weight class is similar, and also the speed uh, would be similar. So uh, I think that it would be very advantageous for our model. Right, because then it would be possible to judge if the elastic uh, or viscoelastic model uh is actually reasonable right and i think this also addresses the question by leonard welthagen um and there's joseph again joseph kovac asking about the yet let's say your next iteration in the model which would be to use a becker type approach to model the sinkage and also slip sinkage uh is that also then implemented in Adams, uh, this interaction model with the terrain, or how is that um, linked to the multi-body simulation yeah, in uh, Adams? We're still working on it because it's hard to uh, to change. This um, contact function is very, um, it's easy to use. But if you want to um, consider uh, the second model of terrain, uh, then we have to mm, think about it uh, and um, add additional forces and um, yeah, it's not that easy we're still working on it um, that you have to make some trick in the program to uh, to to make it indeed indeed yeah yeah that's also what I remember from, from other groups' uh, activities uh, that also started with using atoms but wanted to model uh, operations on deformable terrain. Um, right, Josef, you're typing something else. I see that. Um, okay, very good. Fine. Um, good. Any other questions uh, on Daniela's talk? I see Leonard is typing something. Let's wait. Ah, okay. Very good. Um, Daniela, thank you again. Thank you. And I can wait uh, another presentation from Varsha. That would be fine. Yeah, as, as you wish, as you are available. Uh, because then we are transitioning to the second talk. Uh, Babasha Swami from Virginia Tech, Virginia Institute of Technology.
Um, and she is a grad student with uh, Corina Sandu, our ISTVS president. And uh, Vasha also has been helping, let's say, the logistics of the DES uh, series of, of webinars, let's say, the way we are holding them in ISTVS. And she also um, has uh, authored one of the best papers from the 2022 conference of ISTVS, which is why she's presenting today. Uh, and Vasha will be talking about, uh, let's say, a review of tire terrain interaction models and uh, their validation, basically giving an overview also of the history of tire models and tire terrain interaction models uh, at Virginia Tech and also at large in, in the community, I believe. Vasha, take it away. Hello, I guess I'm audible, right? Okay. Yeah, we hear loud and clear. Thank you so much, Dr. Lutz Richard, for that introduction. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Marsha Swami, um, and I'm here today to present um, our paper, which was a conference paper in the Harbin uh, conference, and it did become uh, a full blown out uh, journal paper. We added a lot of things uh, to the journal paper. Um, and um, it's about um, the review of modeling and validation techniques for tire deformable uh, soil interactions. Um, I've co authored this paper along with uh, Rashna, Dr. Alba Yero, and Dr. Karina Sandu, of course, um, and also uh, from a few GBSC members. Uh, Dr. Denise Rizzo, uh, Rizzo Dr. Uh, Katie Seebeck, and uh, even Dr. David Gorsuch. And uh, I guess the, the idea behind this paper was, well, initially, uh, we were trying to, um, I guess, write um, a literature review for a PhD thesis, right? And that, that was the idea behind it. But very quickly did I realize that, you know, this went beyond just my thesis, the review for my thesis, and I really started concentrating on this. And the idea was to really compile a lot of the results that this community has done since the past around 20 years is what I'm looking into. And uh, it was really nice to see the journey, to see all the things that we've done since the past 20 years, and to be able to justify it in just 20 pages of a journal paper was really hard, uh, but this is our attempt um, I really hope that um, it, it does come to use to some people. Um, but yes, it's it's really um, it's really from from our hearts, and we hope um, it does help people. And I, I I can guarantee that we've had so many reviews with all the authors here. Everybody had a lot of inputs. Um, Dr. Sandu had a lot of inputs. Dr. Yero had a lot of inputs. Dr. David Corsage had a lot of inputs, and all of that kind of just ended up making the paper um, even better. So. Um, of course, I cannot talk about the whole paper, uh, but I will be giving you kind of like an introduction to the paper so that you can probably go um, and read more about it. Uh, but the motivation, as I said, was to compile a lot of these result, uh, results that we've been seeing. And I guess, um, you know, the presentation before by Daniela kind of gave us an idea of the challenges and the complexities that we've had in the modeling uh, world. We have complexities when you know, modeling the terrain, it's deformable. We're trying to model, you know, model Mother Nature herself at this point. Um, we have the deformable tire. Again, it's it's rubber. Um, it has a lot of complex parts in between, which we'll be talking about. So um, it is, it, it can be a little challenging to model. And of course, the, uh, the interaction between the tire and the terrain, the friction model, if you want to say. Um, I, again, that that is also something that we have to consider. Um, and most impo importantly is that, you know, these models, they require some sort of calibration techniques. Uh, at the end of the day, they should be feasible. Um, it shouldn't be um, in such a way that only one person can do it. it you know, it should be reproducible. Um, and along with that, we need to think about validation um, of these models. Um, so this is what the paper is kind of briefly about. We talk about all these challenges and what researchers have been doing, um, what their, you know, point of view is, um, you know, and how we've been tackling this problem since the past few years. 
I guess I would like to also open up discussion towards the end and ask you guys a question. If you've, uh, what you, what do you think is the most complex part in the in the modeling? I talked about five things right now. What do you think would be the most complex? And you know, how did you probably tackle that? Do you, do you have any ideas and uh, things like that? So I would really love to uh, to hear from you, even in the chat section, because I I really love to ask people these type of questions. Um, but yeah, taking off um, the objective again. Uh, it's just provide a literature survey um, for the last 20 years is, is the data that we're kind of looking into since the, the early 2000s. And um, a special emphasis has been given to numerical techniques because um, I know there are already reviews on all, all the empirical and semi-empirical models and many people in the audience, as I see, are very um, aware about these models. Those were the building blocks and the fundamentals of terra mechanics. Um, but now, Along with that, I will discuss a little bit about that, um, you know, transitioning into these numerical models. Um, why do we need numerical models and how are we bridging the gap between, I would say, the virtual world and what you see in, in reality? And again, how do we bridge the gap between just the all, you know, the empirical models and what we have with the numerical models? I think that's another different aspect that we really need to consider. So the outline uh, goes that we have uh, talk a little bit about the modeling approaches. Uh, we talk about um, you know modeling of the terrain. Again, it's the five things that you know we, we, we're talking about. I talked about in the first slide. We talk about the terrain. We talk about the tire. We talk about the interface, and we also talk about validation methods. Again, for the tire, for the soil, for the tire deformable soil, uh, the whole system together. And uh, in the end, we have some final discussions and conclusions, and I hope to hear more of your thoughts, too, towards the end of the presentation. So we'll be starting off with modeling approaches. Um, of course, we have, you can you know, classify it in different ways, but at the end of the day, we have more of your empirical or semi-empirical type of approaches. And we have now what you know we've been really seeing since the past, I think, uh, 10 to 20 years, really coming up and blowing up uh, the numerical techniques. Um, the empirical and the semi-empirical, um, which I will discuss a little bit about, um, again, these are legacy, legacy codes, legacy things that have existed. Um, and again, there's no question to are they right or wrong. My, my intention is not to say that, you know, they're lacking in any way. I feel like they are really quick. They get the job done um, and it's it's very much needed. Uh, the army is has most of, you know, th the things on, on these type of systems and they really work good. So, um, you know, you have the VCI testing, the, the WES mobility numeric model, the numerics, um, the, you know, mean maximum pressure models. Again, these are all legacies and again, I would just like to say, wow, you know, you cannot touch that amount of data and the amount of thought and the hard work that people have really put in to develop these type of models. But um, there, there kind of comes, I guess, a line where sometimes it, it does become a little hard to explain everything um, just with, say, uh, empirical models. Um, I'll give you an example. For example, I was working on, um, you know, in, in my internship there, I was working on uh, soil interacting with tines. And of course, you can capture probably using cavity expansion the effect of cohesion. You can get the effect of all your, you know, elastic modulus is density. That's that's great. But um, what happens when the time starts clogging? Uh, can you be able to model that? Of course, you can use some sort of engineering judgment and have some something based off of data. But if you do it, you know, in 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 the numerical world, it, it becomes more easier because these phenomena can be easily replicated. So the numerical techniques, I guess, well, at least my rule of thumb is if the deformations are high, um, you know, probably looking into numerical techniques might do you some good. Uh, if the deformations are not that that high, you, empirical and semi-empirical, all the legacy codes really do a really good job. So um, again, in numerical techniques, we have discrete mechanics and continuum mechanics. My rule of thumb, I guess I would say, is if if the continuum approach can be applied to your soil, um, I, I would use it. If it cannot be applied, which I understand sometimes for gravel and these big sand particles, 
um, the discrete element method does do good jobs there. But um, in, in general, the continuum approximation is a really good approximation, and we should take advantage of it. Um, so I, I, I do believe where, wherever it's possible to have that approximation uh, to use it. So um, again, in continuum, we have uh, different techniques that have blown up since the past few years. Um, we have FEM, we have arbitrary um, Lagrangian Eulerian methods, we have SPH, which is a, which is a meshless technique, uh, material point method, another uh, technique that's um, you know, really getting developed right now and um, many people can place their bets on it. So um, uh, I guess this is a big overview of the different type of techniques that are there. And I guess at this point, I will go more in in specific to numerical techniques um and and again a big concentration on the continuum based techniques uh, i'm just going to say a little bit about dem um, of course in dem what you're trying to do is you're trying to uh, model soil particles as, as they are and uh, you know capture the interaction between them um, you can put um, you know the interaction models are usually in 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 the form of spring and damper models between um, you know the particles in the long, uh, in the vertical and the you know tangential directions. That's the base basic principle in DEM. Um, parameterizing DEM uh, can be quite quite a challenge, um, even if you're using the tests. Um, say they usually use the angle of repose test. They use uh, the triaxial test usually to parameterize these models. But uh, you have so many parameters um, to to parameterize, right? So guaranteeing the uniqueness of the solution and things like that can be quite a little bit um, of a challenge. But uh, once you have the DEM um, parameterized, I think it does uh, become, you know. Quite, quite um, it does become quite a good technique, uh, but yes, it does have very high computational time. Um, moreover, if you're trying to you know simulate cohesion, like co uh, you know particles with which have cohesion, I do know that there are some techniques out there, like the parallel bond technique. There, um, the Hertz Mindlin with bonding. There, there are a few models out there that do that, uh, but sometimes it it can get a little uh, tricky. So. Um, yeah, I guess that's it about DEM. DEM goes really good with CFD. Um, if you want to do any sort of coupling, that's uh, that's the other technique. Um, uh, you know, people have have tried. I, I don't know if it, they've done it in entire terrain interactions, but I know that people have simulated water going through uh, DEM soil and stuff like that for for moisture content. But uh, DEM is great. Um, but we will be moving more towards uh, the continuum based technique. And we have FEM, ALE, SPH, and MPM. FEM is great. Um, again, there's a legacy behind FEM. Um, I, I would say, honestly, it's the most well thought of numerical technique. Uh, the only issue with FEM is, of course, when you have large deformations, well, poor FEM is not meant for that. So if you're having really you know, soft soil with a lot of splashing and sloshing going on, um, FEM may not do you good. But in general, um, if your deformations are not that th that much, um, FEM does give you a really good answer. Um, so yes, FEM, um, very important technique. Um, ALE, um, which is arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian technique. Um, this well, this technique has adaptive meshing. So uh, you do the Lagrangian step, and the mesh deforms. And after that, it, it does material advection and the mesh comes back to its uh, original place. So um, you don't have the you know, uh, elements failing like you do in um, FEM. It is a hybrid between the Lagrangian and the Eulerian technique, uh, but it can be really computationally expensive. At least in my experience, it's been quite, uh, quite expensive. Um, another technique is the SPH technique. So this, this is a pure meshless technique. And in fact, it's the first meshless technique that came out in 72. Um, and uh, of course, um, it's, I would say this, it's not as elegant as FEM. It's a little ad hoc, but um, the approximations do work. We're seeing a lot of validation that's happening in SPH um, off lately. 
Um, the math behind SPH is not, it's, it's not that hard. Um, and sometimes it can be challenging in SPH because we do have inherent problems um, like with all particle-based techniques with things like tensile instability, um, applying boundary conditions, um, hourglassing, for example. So there are a few numerical instabilities, especially when uh, you know you have very highly dynamic events, but um, there, there are um, good, good enough solution uh, procedures um, in case you get into something like that. So SPH is, I guess, is becoming very popular right now, um, ex especially for modeling territory interactions. But yes, it is quite a great technique. Um, another technique that we have coming up is uh, MPM, which is material point method. Uh, I do know my advisor, um, Dr. Uh, Alba Yara Colum, she works a lot in this technique. Um, again, it does classify as a particle-based technique, and it's you're doing something really smart here. You have a background mesh, but you also have the particles. So you solve everything in the background mesh. You solve all your equations in the background mesh, interpolate it onto your material points. The material points move, and then you go back and kind of reset that mesh. So um, a very smart technique. Uh, they're still, I guess, working on how to get um, anything that's not like we you can easily interact rigid fem parts with mpm but uh if you're looking at more deform deformable type of tires you might need um hyperelasticity and stuff like that so they are working on different techniques to probably um kind of get get this into play so um so this is about the modeling approaches um and now that we know the approaches, let's go more on to the modeling of deformable terrains. So um, again, we have empirical and semi-empirical based methods. Um, this is where I would put all the pressure sinkage and the shear stress, shear strain type of uh, relations in which we saw in Danielle's presentation. That's what she's primarily using. Um, and again, they, um, they're very useful, especially when you want to do such type of models. Um, Sometimes I, I do understand in these type of models, it does get a little uh, tricky, especially if you're wanting, wanting to simulate bulldozing, um, if you're having all sorts of slip sinkage, if you're having um, you know the multi-pass effects because essentially your, your material parameters in the terrain after a pass should change. So it, it does get a little um, complex there, but um, I do know, I guess um, the HSSTM model that Dr. Karina Sandu worked on, uh, it, it does consider a lot of these factors. So um, I, they're very powerful, they're pretty quick. Um, and uh, I guess, um, yep, they've, they've been around since a long time, so I don't wanna talk about them too much. Um, the next technique is, you know, when you're using, um, you know, material models for physics-based calibration. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is, you know, you have your FEM models. So how do you define the, the material? How do you define the soil? So in continuum mechanics, you do need uh, what we call as a material constitutive law or the stress strain re uh, relationship. And uh, again, this can get a little tricky because uh, you do need to do a lot of tests and you need to um, you know, parameterize it. In general, soils, the reason why soils are difficult to handle is because they have this you know, volumetric behavior. If you shear a soil, you can have either contraction or dilation. And that's what makes soil tricky to model. So there are different um, material models that you can use. Uh, we have the Moore Coulomb, the Drucker Prager, um, the Drucker Prager cap model, which is a little bit more advanced, takes into account a little bit of the history of the soil because of the cap that you have. Um, you also have the modified cam clay model, which is all a part of what we call as critical state soil mechanics. Um, I guess in general, talking about soil and material models, it's honestly like full, full blown out PhD level courses that I've had to take. And I can go on and on about them, but um, I guess I'm going to stop at this point. But um, in general, one thing that I did learn was that you, for sands, most of the properties or most of the uh, behavior is it, it you know you can all trace it down to the density of the sand it's it's really dependent on the density but for clays which is more what we call as fine grain materials um, what you trace it down to is actually the history of the loading that the clay has um, 
the, the clay has experienced. And based on that, you have all your peaking behaviors, or you can have just like a flat behavior, um, the type of graphs that you would have probably seen in Wong. But again, as I said, this is another full blown out, I guess, another one hour lecture series. Um, so I'm just going to stop there. Um, now, what is important, as I said, it's not just having the model, but thinking about feasible ways to just parameterize the model. And again, there are different ways that we can do this. We have geotechnical tests, uh, your full blown out triaxial uh, tests, your uniaxial tests, uh, the direct shear tests. Uh, you can also think about doing institute tests like the, the famous and the legendary cone penetrometer test. Nothing beats that. Um, and also, of course, your uh, pressure sinkage and the direct shear tests. So let's get into um, the modeling of tires for these type of uh, um, interactions. Again, we have the semi-empirical tire models, and then I'm going to talk about the more uh, numerical type of tire models. Um, now, the semi-empirical tire models, what I've seen usually there will be some sort of combination of springs and dampers that will be used to um, define, uh, I would say, replicate the global behavior of the tire. Um, on the other hand, your more physics-based FEM tire models, um, they can be a pain to make because uh, there are so many you know, details in the tire that you might wanna capture. The bead, the bead fillers that could be hyperelastic. You have the car cast and the belts that kind of run in different directions. So, you know, you might need orthotropic elasticity here to describe them. Um, you're you're going to have a lot of layers of rubber in between, uh, all hyperelastic or viscoelastic. Viscoelastic is better, of course. Um, and you would have the thread, um, again, being, um, you know, viscoelastic. So, again, it's... it's um, it's very hard not just to create the model, uh, the dimensions for the model, but also to parameterize each and every different component um, of the tire. But um, it's not it's not like it's impossible, but it does take a lot of work. So when, once you have it, you know, the tire tire model is fixed. It's it's valued on any surface if it's validated. Of course, it's valued on any surface. You don't have to touch with it. Uh, the next topic is modeling of the tire soil inter interface. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about it. Um, in numerical techniques, you need to have some sort of contact mechanism. We usually use what we call the penalty-based technique. Uh, you can read more about this in the paper. Um, you do need to have some sort of friction law uh, between the tire and the terrain. Um, and uh, usually, most of us just use the more cool and friction, but there are a few works that have um, experimented with, say, anisotropic friction or even the Lugray friction model. I think the MBD guys know more about friction and they've had it more in their community since a long time than we've had it, um, um, uh, like we've given consideration to it. Um, and once you have your friction law picked out, you need to have a, you need to do parameterization. So you might want to do some sort of experimental testing, um, like the traction test, or um, there's one interesting study by uh, Papa Michael that, you know, he puts a tire and then soil on the other surface and has a direct shear test between them. So um, different ways to parameterize it, but yes, it, friction can be a sensitive parameter. So it, we do, we should give some sort of importance to it. Um, and then lastly, validation methods. Now, I, I used to have, well, I have, I used to have a professor in, uh, in my undergrad and he said this, again, in a very, in a very simple way. He said, any model without validation is garbage in, garbage out. And I couldn't write that in the paper, but what he means to say that, you know, every model should have validation um, or else it's, it's very hard to know what's right, what's wrong. Um, another thing that I've kind of realized through my PhD is that um, I need to ask myself whenever I'm reading a paper, to what level or degree of validation has this, um, you know, ha ha has this study had? But just because the stresses are validated need not mean that the deformations are, or vice versa. So it's very good to know what level of validation um, has, has it had. And of course, we have validations for the soil. Um, what we propose is like a multi-level kind of validation. So uh, it, it would be good to validate the soil, um, the tire, and then the tire soil in interaction altogether. So there are here are a few techniques for validation of the soil. 
Um, you have, of course, the classic geotechnical lab tests, the pressure sinkage tests, the shear stress, shear displacement, and of course, the cone penetrometer tests. You can do validation based off of that. Um, tire validation can um, be a little bit more exciting because you can do either static tests or dynamic tests. Um, the static deflection test, the footprint test, um, the contact stress distribution test are all static tests that are um, good to think about if you're thinking about validation. Um, you can also have dynamic tests like the drum cleat test. Um, that's for the vibration analysis. Um, you can have the rolling radius test or even cornering type of tests. So in general, you would need a pretty big setup not too big but like a, a setup for some sort of validation um and you can have indoor soil bin facilities there can be outdoor testing or even scale model testing provided um you have scaled down all the physics um of the model um and some common tests uh, that i've seen people usually recreate um are free rolling tests of course the traction and the braking tests and even cornering tests so a lot of thought goes into just getting the again the, i guess the test rate together but once it's together there's a lot of validation that you can do additionally researchers have i guess um these are usually the parameters that they have validated so the deformations in the soil um people have even 3d scanned the rut which i think is a really good idea um, there was an interesting study where Faradi even put, put in um, plaster and got the mold of the rut, which I think was it's going to be fun to do. Um, you can validate the stresses, as I said, in, in the soil. You can validate, of course, the drawbar pull, uh, the traction. You can validate the rolling resistance. You can validate the, you know, the rut. Many things you can validate about. Now, I don't want to talk too much, but there are there is more in the paper uh, that I do urge you to read. Um, we do have another section about the application. Um, and, you know, really now this is the part where we discuss about all the different studies. And I see a lot of people in the audience whose papers I've read and probably referred in this um, in this paper. So, um, yes, there is more in the paper. And towards the end, what we give you is kind of this very consolidated a uh, big table um, giving a good summary of each and every paper. Now, the idea is for me to keep updating them and probably have another version by the end of my PhD, uh, but let's see. Um, so at the end of the day, I'm just going to kind of get you to the conclusions. Um, and, and I guess, I mean, you know, we have empirical techniques, we have numerical techniques. And I remember I was in conversation with uh, Pei Lin Song, who's from Erdek, and he told me that, you know, both the techniques have to meet at some time. So I think that's a really good way of saying it. And I think our future work should be based off of that, um, thinking about how both these worlds meet and then think about how, you know, the simulation world will meet, I guess, um, reality. So there's a lot we can think about, but in specific, I do talk about, I guess, the different areas um, that we can concentrate on um, uh, towards the end. So yeah, that's all. I would like to acknowledge um, our sponsor, I guess, um, the Automotive Research Center um, with, with whom we work and GVSC. Um, and um, I guess I would like to invite uh, everybody for questions or any feedback or any any sort of discussions. Abs absolutely, uh, Vasha. Thanks very much. Great overview. Um, yeah, do we have questions on Vasha's talk? Uh, I'm just looking at the chat. Uh, Joseph, you were asked. OK, I'm reading your question. Um, just to come my opinion. Uh, you can model very large deformation using an FE-based discretization. It really depends what underlying formulation is used and how the discretization or oh, oh, slip in away. Let me probably open it up too. Yeah, right. <clears throat> it really depends what underlying formulation is used and how the discretization is done. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. there are ways in, in finite element modeling that allow you to uh, describe large deformations. I think you um, you were not excluding that, right, in your survey? Yes. Yes. 
So my understanding is that NPM can generally model large displacement, large deformation problems well, mm -hmm. but the model is, uh, yes, modeling the contact. That is, um, yes, that is the biggest problem with NPM. I do know that there are different research groups that are working on interfacing um, FEM with NPM. Um, I, I know it's, it's going to take quite, um, quite some time. Um, the paper that I had referenced, I guess, in my, uh, right, this paper. So this is, this paper is actually uh, by uh, Zhu and it, it's also by my advisor, Dr. Alba Yerakolam. And in that, so they're just interacting a rigid FE tire um, with NPM. So that, that you can do. I guess beautifully that's that's not a problem but again you need to go and you know you need to because you have a mesh you need to figure out okay um is the tire which mesh is the tire in how much of tire is in the mesh how much of soil is in the mesh and come up with some sort of algorithms and um kind of kind of do that so it is a big challenge to put uh to interface npm uh with um, FEM, and I think people are working on that at, at, at this point. But um, if you're looking at if you're looking at a rigid material, uh, I think it, it can be done. I know that people have done a lot of uh, cone penetrometer studies with NPM, and it works really, really good, really good, smooth results. Um, even if you have like varying, you know, soil uh, layering and 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 things like that. So I, I do think that they are headed in that way and that i know that dr yero at least she tells me that that that's one of the things that the whole community the whole npm community is working on um at this point uh yosef if you can hear me uh you may have received like an invitation to enter the so-called stage of the meeting because if you confirm that then you will be able to talk <laughs> and maybe that that would be useful right now I think somebody else have sent you like an invitation to enter the stage, as it's called. Massimo, who or Jenna, who was sending that invitation to Joseph? Yeah, Joseph is here now. I'm oh. here. Oh, great. Sorry, I can enter the chat. So... I didn't really want to interrupt. <laughs> And just I can just put there my comments and questions. So I guess I'm gonna try to answer the question by Dr. Alex Keen. Um, no, the I will never say that the models older than 20 years are redundant. I think that's what I started off with. These are legacy codes. You can't can't touch them. They have so much experimental backing. Um, they've worked so far. So. Um, I, I guess there's always this debate between um, numerical versus empirical, which way to go. Um, I believe it re honestly depends on the project, what what you're looking for at the end of the day, um, what is you, what is of interest. Um, because I, as I said, I, I was I was um, I was involved with some sort of you know modeling of tines, um, you know dragging through soil. And um, although you can, I know, and I know NRMM, for example, um, has a good model of the tines and doing all of that. But but still, sometimes there are a few things that it's just very hard to do empirically. That of course, if the empirical model is there, um, you can use it and get a good estimation. But trust me, with with the numerical techniques, I used SPH, and I would get you know, results spot on with what the experimental results were. Um, and specifically for the time problem, what, what I could get to know is that there was, you know, soil clogging between the tines um, that you cannot really take into consideration um, in, in the in the model that was there in NRMM. They did have a relationship where they said that once, uh, you know, you know, the so-and-so happens, um, the tine would behave like a blade and not really a tine. But I guess there are a few, as I said, a few, uh, you know, places. Um, I, I would say that numerical model modeling will give you an edge. 
but I do understand that it is it's all dependent on what the project is. If you have that enough time and resources to run a numerical model, it's good to run it. If you don't, it can be really expensive. Um, so yeah, at the, at the end of the day, I think I, I think it's honestly what the project requires. And uh, yes, I would always say NRMM or any type of empirical based codes or anything, they're all they're all legacy codes. We can never touch them. They're all up there. If I ever do any numerical modeling, I would look up to them and I would validate my stuff with them. So that's the level I would place these legacy codes at. In that regard, Vasha, I think uh, Brad Hansen made an interesting point here in the chat. Uh, so he's just cautioning that, let's say, from the perspective of uh, yes. experience at, in the, at the arm. The yes. army, so with military ground vehicles, so he's thing he's just cautioning that uh, that a lot of the numerical approaches seem to be having problems uh, in the field. Let's say when when real data is coming in from field operations. That's how I take his question. Yes, uh, yes. Let's address that maybe. Also, maybe we can bring Brett on the stage to talk to yeah. it Looks because I'd it's be interested. Uh, yes. Just a couple of comments uh, for Varsha. Um, I put that in partly for the benefit of, of Dean Freitag, who some of the audience <laughs> will remember from years past, and uh, some of his uh, comments that he puts in, he's put into the Journal of Terra Mechanics over the years, uh, even as far through to the 90s. Um, and very often if, if you go back to it to a lot of the, the the very early papers then they do actually pick up things which come up later on and very often they are missed but uh, yeah, the point yeah. was i think you 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 covered a little bit there is that um a lot of those equations like brixius and yanoshi and Hunamoto, which has got a, a really nice form instead of yes. using the parameters as they uh, in terms of cohesion and, and, and uh, 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 internal angle of friction, so on. If you just use those as constants, you can actually fit that general form of equation to almost most traction uh, curves. So mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have to be stuck to the to the way that they've used it. The general form of equation uh, is actually quite useful. And yes. as you said, when you go to carry out practical tests. And, and I've done that for, for, for decades with students uh, and very often using the same tractors in the same soil, uh, we would use maybe four or five different equations uh, and from one year to another, we get slight differences where one equation, one year, uh, Lismer and Luth works, next that year it's a, it's a Brexit, next year it doesn't really would go somewhere between the two. Uh, but one of the key things about it is that uh, they're very quick to calculate and particularly if you combine them with other things. I, I, I did some of my work was combining it with vibration, the effect of, of, of uh, vibration on traction and particularly the, the, the key variable in there was wheel load or one of the key variables was wheel load. And by using bits of equation that worked, not particularly one particular equation, very often I found something that actually worked with the experimental test results that I was getting. Um, so I suppose the question I would say is, and I, I probably don't see it a great deal now, is uh, who is actually testing the numerical methods against the older equations? Because you may find that sometimes the old equations may work, yes, they may not, yes. but they may work as well in very often, and particularly in applied situations. If you're driving a, an SUV across uh, world country, um, you want a quick result if, if, if that was needed. But in agriculture, for example, you, uh, most of the work will be with very low slips because in this day and age, sinkage is bad and uh, high slips are bad. And therefore you're working on quite a small range of, of, of parameters if you want to use that term. Uh, and, 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 and therefore, um, trying to get real results, you may actually have to modify the equations in real terms as you're working, as, as you're actually working. So it's just a, a comment sort of 
that don't throw away the old equations completely because sometimes oh, no. in some situations <laughs> you may find that uh, they're actually easier to use and they may also pick up some of the error that is coming out of the other equations which may be very very difficult to find because a lot of the uh, numerical techniques they do actually very often uh, use uh, uh, empirical data to put in as constants so where do those where does that data come from Yes, yes. Um, so I think I, there's a lot of things that you said. I think in, in one of in one of I think when I covered up like towards the end, I think that's what I say. Like you know, the future work is to unite both the worlds, um, and I think it's very important. Yes, I, I mean empirical relationships are always they're always good. You look at them, uh, and you look, and they're so simple, they're quick, they're so elegant. I don't think anything can replace something like that. So. Um, as I said, but with, with the empirical relationships, the thing is probably that there is, um, I would say we need to understand what are the scenarios we can you know, put it in, plug it in. Um, what are the, I wouldn't say limitations with empirical thing, because it's all data driven, you have more of this, it's only applicable for so-and-so. But if you're in that so-and-so field or in that area, it, it works beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing with numerical techniques, which I would see is a little different, is um, it's just applicable. It's the same formulation. If you get it done right, done once, it's the same thing and it's applicable for a huge, huge array of things. So it's so that's why it, with numerical techniques, it's, it's kind of like I just need to set up the simulation once and I can recreate whatever parameter, whatever, you know, tipsy turn you want to throw in you you can turn you can change the tire design you can True. you can what, do anything what, but what you <laughs> might end up with is a is a is a big database with yes, loads and loads that, of data and yes. then you're going to empirically try and choose the piece yes. of data which fits what you want to do and then are you yes. working backwards rather than than the uh forward so um and the other thing to remember of course is that terrain if you move forward in a field and you go forward a few meters, it always changes a little bit, at least ways it does where I am in the UK. Some areas of the world, it's a lot more homogeneous, ah, yes. but it's really completely homogeneous. And so uh, you don't want to be doing those calculations uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in very sophisticated physics models because of the time involved and yes, the size yes. of the database, et cetera. Anyway, it's just a, a point to bring up and, uh, um just to uh, to remember our our uh, our, uh, our four bearers if you like the dean freitags and the brixius and the alan reese's yes. and the, uh, <laughs> uh, some of the others and you've seen a lot of the names i'm sure yes yes can we hear okay, from, from can we bring uh I'll, I'll bring leave the now. on stage or can we no alex thank you uh we're having a great discussion here I like that. Uh, Bradley, Brad Hansen, are you there? And I am trying to. He had appeared on stage for a moment, I think, and then he went away. I hope he's not having. Hello, Brad. Hello. Okay. <laughs> there he is. I can hear you. Yeah, very good. Uh, Brad, if you want to elaborate a little bit on your remark, I'd love to hear. Yeah, so um, Brad Hansen or Dr. Brad Hansen, I work at uh, Erdic and I work with Varsha this summer a little bit. And um, so I'm heavy in, in the empirical models as uh, she uh, showed very well. And, um, you know, one of the big things on the numerical modeling side is that you, the uh, operational environment almost can't even be uh, modeled in, in the numeric space. Because even with lab testing, for example, you are going against nature by forcing the soils to be whatever you want them to be. Um, and that's just not how, you know, the soils develop. Um, you can give it the right density, you can give it the right strength. And then and, and the Army's past, we've found that even doing that, uh, once you make all your models or even your empirical models are based on lab data, as soon as you bring it out into the field, it breaks down and then you you have to have some additional factors to adjust it again for the operational uh, environment. However, the, you know, the miracle modeling space, what it can do is really hone in on some of those specific uh, physics that might be able to answer or enhance some of the pieces of the empirical model. 
I don't think they'll ever replace it because as Alex uh, said, uh, he hit it really, really well about how, uh, you know, for, you know, the, depending on what you're uh, trying to simulate, for example, are you trying to do mobility analysis for an entire country or are you trying to really understand the forces on a wheel? Like those are two completely different um, uh, just uh, ranges of, of, of calculations because so you're never going to use an American model to do countrywide but if you're looking for the specific physical interactions between the tire and the soil that's where we need numerical modeling and just understand that don't try to overreach the numerical model and don't try to over speak to the empirical model saying it's doing explicit physics all the way down to you know the the, the molecule <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, no, I, I remember we've had discussions on this, and I guess, um, as, as I with numerical model, and I, I've always said this throughout the presentation, uh, the numerical models again, they're all legacy codes, and these are things we can never replace. Um, I know how the army, uh, with you know, because I've had interactions with you, and you know, we've talked about it. You know, it's it's all based on empirical systems, and that's that's been working, and it's been working for a good reason, and um. Again, whoever does numerical modeling, I don't think, well, at least I don't know about others, but it, for me, the aim is not to recreate something that you could do empirically. Like I know the tank relationships um, and all the stuff that you guys have at NRMM, I know they're really good, they're very solid. Um, and I don't need, I, people in numerical modeling, we don't really need to replicate it. I mean, we can do it just to ensure that the model is working and to make sure the physics is right. That's that's a different, um, I would say that's a different approach. But um, the, the idea with numerical modeling is not to touch what empirical and semi-empirical mo models can do. Um, the idea is to touch beyond what these models can do. And, and in every problem, you will uh, I guess face that one situation. And again, um, yes, I understand, but you cannot, you can never do countrywide modeling like how NRMM does with the empirical relationships. Oh my God, you cannot do that with um, numerical modeling. But one thing you can do with numerical modeling, again, it's not that we are trying to get the one exact uh, answer. Uh, what we, I think, what numerical modeling can do is really give you bounds um, because if you know that in this area, the soil is, you know, this type of classification, because I know you can get that from the database. Um, if you know that, you know, this is the moisture content through, during this season, um, you can uh, pretty much have a good guess on what the soil parameters might be. And also uh, with numerical modeling, give a good range, a pretty good range of what the solution might you know, fall into. And, you know, if you're having um, things like, you know, different soils, like I would say that the top layer of the soil is, is say soft, and then you have a hard layer. So things like this, that it becomes a little, I would say, hard to do in, in, um, in empirical based modeling. It's something that numerical models can beautifully do, uh, given they have the computational time, given you have the resources, given you have all of that. If you don't have all of that, as I said, you need to look at it as a project at the end of the day. If the project allows for you to have those resources, when I say resources, the time of uh, the computational, you should probably have, a, you know, have big computers to do this. So if you have all of that, and if the project supports it, then numerical modeling is great to do. If if that's not the aim, if the aim is, you know, that, okay, you know, I understand because the army, especially you're gonna have situations where you gotta take a call in like, I don't know, a few minutes. So if that's the case, nobody's gonna be doing any numerical modeling. So I think this is more of the work behind uh, I, I would I would say a little bit behind the hood that we need to do, and I'm sure with the uh, with the computers that come out, uh, the next generation computers, uh, you know, we would you know think about how the computational speed will increase and things like that. Uh, but but yeah, you know, there's there's a lot that we can do in numerical modeling that um, you know it, it has its own its own area. Um, I I do not recommend in overlapping with what semi-empirical models do. And as I said, these are legacies that we can never replace. Um, what numerical modeling does is to, I would say, support um, support that legacy and, and take, um, take things a little bit far beyond and consider a few details that 
uh, we didn't back in the days. And again, the whole question would become on, is it worth it or is it not? Which is a huge debate to have. And again, as I said, it just depends on the project. So everything goes back to the project and what the researcher or the whoever the, the facility is interested in. And, um, and based on that, you pick what you need to do. I guess it's an art uh, to you know know what to do given the problem statement. It's 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 um, how you as a researcher take it, and it's how you apply it. So um, again, I would never. For me, I don't I don't believe in disadvantages. I only believe in consequences at the end of the day. I believe in karma. So I don't I don't like to pull, bring things out as uh, disadvantages. I just like to say that everything has its own right and its own place. Well said. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, that that's a great discussion, um, and uh, I think we'll be uh, transitioning, let's say, to the closing remarks now um, of this event. I hand it over to Massimo, our general secretary. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Lutz. I'll try to uh, to make it uh, to make it quick to. So I can, we can wrap this up. So uh, I think you can see all the relevant information in our outro slide, which is now on the screen. And uh, for your convenience, I've also reposted uh, all the relevant links uh, to the chat. So, so you can find it uh, in either place. So uh, first important announcement, uh, our, the ISTVS 2024 conference uh, is taking place uh, in Yokohama, Japan. This is going to be our 21st international and 12th Asia Pacific regional conference. Uh, and it will take place from October 28th to October 31st. Uh, so the link uh, to the website again is on the chat and uh, abstract submission uh, opens on February uh, 15th, so exactly two weeks from now, uh, from today, and uh, you'll be receiving an official uh, call for papers via our uh, standard email newswire soon. So uh, keep an eye uh, both on the website and in, on your uh, email uh, inboxes for the official uh, announcement. Second, second item, uh, item second announcement. Uh, it's membership, ISTVS membership renewal season. So, uh, well, for those of you who are already members and have not already renewed for 2024, I kindly invite you to renew at your earliest uh, convenience. So, uh, I mean, you're not a bad person if you're not if you have not already done it. But uh, please put a note on that uh, if you have not already done so. And for those of you joining us today, uh, of course, if you are not already a member, I really strongly invite you to consider uh, joining uh, ISTVS and becoming. Uh, and active members of our community. And uh, if you are interested in these topics, and if you uh, joined us today, for sure you are, uh, uh, you know, joining the society will bring uh, benefits both to you and to the society. And uh, we are constantly looking for new active members that can bring uh, new energy and help us with all the initiatives like the digital event series that we are trying you know to uh, to keep pushing forward but you know it's it's hard work and uh we could really use some help so uh, uh i uh, i also posted my email contact in the chat so if you're interested in uh, either uh, being a speaker for our next event or being uh, helping out with the society, any of the society activities, uh, definitely please get in touch uh, with me. And third announcement, uh, well, this was the, the was the kickstart event for our 2024 digital event series. 
and of course there are many more to come and we are uh we are already working um on the next events and again they will be announced both on the website and via our email uh newswire so again please keep an eye both on the website and on your email inbox because uh you will find there the announcement for uh for the upcoming events and again if you're interested in being one of the next speakers or you want to recommend a possible speaker or a possible institution uh that might be interested in showcasing their work and do a presentation in a des event about the research work please again get in touch with me i will i will really be glad to receive such such an input from you uh and finally we have already seen some of them appear on video today but we didn't officially introduce any of them so uh first of all i would like to give a, a shout out to our ISTVS officers and secretaries that appeared, uh, that joined the call today. So Alex Keen, who also appeared on camera and he is our national secretary uh, for the United Kingdom, but he is also um, our team leader for the digital event series and uh, resource initiative activities. So, uh, yeah, we deeply appreciate uh, what you do, Alex, for coordinating these activities. And so thanks again from all the team. And, uh, and also we had joining us today our president, uh, Professor Corina Sandu, uh, Professor Skal Skalk Els from South Africa, University of Pretoria, our Deputy General uh, Secretary for Europe Africa. He didn't join us on video, but I saw him lurking uh, in the people in the people list. And our uh, secretary, national secretary for Canada, who also appeared on video, uh, Joseph Kovacs. So uh, thanks again for all our valuable officers and secretaries who contribute to our society and to our, all our activities. So yeah, finally, I guess that that was all uh, on my side. So I'll leave it to our official host for today, Luth Richter, for the final for the final goodbye. I guess with pleasure, Massimo, and thank you, everybody. Uh, I especially enjoyed the very vivid, uh, uh, intense discussion on the two talks. Uh, this is always the best part, <laughs> I think. And uh, yeah, uh, looking forward to the next DES event uh, and later this year also to the, the in-person conference. Uh, please join us again as you're able. Oh, thank you. Uh, sorry, Lutz, sorry to cut you off. I was forgetting Possibly, one yeah. very important thing. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I thanked everyone. Uh, it was obviously obvious that I want to thank all the attendees for today's event and our two amazing speakers for today. So uh, Varsha and Daniela, uh, thanks again for accepting to be our speakers for today and for giving uh, such good presentation and for triggering such a good discussion as the one we've had today. So uh, yeah, thanks again to everyone for making this a successful event. Thanks again. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye.